In the early 1980s, the popularity of home computers and video games was spreading across North America. With the Commodore VIC-20, the whole family can learn computing at home. As the technology improved and became more affordable, computer enthusiasts were finding new ways of bypassing or hacking systems. At the same time, fears of nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union were escalating. Screenwriters Walter Parks and Lawrence Lasker took this fear of nuclear war, mixed in a whiz kid hacker, and developed a story about a supercomputer taking civilization to the brink of Armageddon. Flush the bombers, get the subs in launch mode. We are at DEFCON 1. Released in 1983, War Games. Shall we play a game? The script for the film, originally titled The Genius, was first developed in 1979, eventually turning into War Games. Parks and Lasker spent time researching hacker culture, computer technology, nuclear missiles, military simulation programs, and organizations like NORAD. Producer Leonard Goldberg was impressed with the script. He shopped the idea around to different studios, but the reception was not very positive. Nobody seemed to get it. They didn't understand the technology. They said, is this science fiction? Goldberg was finally able to get interest from MGM United Artists, and in the summer of 1982, the film went into production. The movie begins with a U.S. military exercise of its missile commanders. This exercise is part of a larger test conducted by NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, to find out if its missile commanders are willing to follow through on orders to launch nuclear weapons. The testing shows that 22% of the missile commanders do not go through with the missile launch. U.S. government officials are concerned with this and agree to take humans out of the launch equation. A supercomputer, the War Operation Plan Response, referred to as the Whopper, is directly connected to the missile launch system. The Whopper has already fought World War III as a game, time and time again. In Seattle, we're introduced to high school student David Lightman. David has an interest in computers, in addition to getting into a little mischief. He figures out a way into his school's computer system and changes his grades. He also changes a grade for his classmate Jennifer. When David reads about some yet-to-be-released computer games, he tries finding a way into the computer system to get more info on the games. But he doesn't find the computer company. Instead, he stumbles across a list of games on a military computer directory. Oh my god. Unable to get into the military system and play the games, David hopes to find a way in by learning about the original programmer of the system, Professor Stephen Falcon. After researching Falcon's life, who is listed as deceased, David figures out the password and gets into the military system. While David and Jennifer play global thermonuclear war, the system at NORAD shows the Soviets are launching missiles against American targets. The computer team at NORAD realizes this isn't a real attack from the Russians. Someone on the outside fed an attack simulation into the Matrix simulation! Within two days, David is tracked down as the hacker, arrested, and brought to the NORAD Operations Center. After being questioned, David gets back into the system and finds the thermonuclear war game is still running. But it's unclear if this is just a simulation, or if the computer thinks the war is actually happening. Is this a game, or is it real? What's the difference? Oh, wow. After investigating this mishap further, the military officials at NORAD are not convinced David is just a high school student pulling a prank. Once again thinking Soviet forces are moving towards American targets. The US military is taking action as if this is a real attack. David is able to escape from NORAD. He reconnects with Jennifer and they search for Professor Falcon, who is not dead after all. After convincing the professor to help, it's up to David and Falcon to convince American forces that the Soviet attacks are merely a simulation and then stop the Whopper computer from launching nuclear missiles that will kick off World War III. War Games was a film that did achieve success at the box office and with many critics, but that success came after several challenges during the film's production. Up-and-coming director Martin Brest was hired to direct the film, 
but creative issues between him and writers Walter Parks and Lawrence Lasker led to some heated moments. The result was the two writers being fired from the project. But the production challenges continued, as Martin Brest reportedly wanted the film to have a darker tone, contrasting with the producer's and the studio's vision. Executive producer Leonard Goldberg has stated the studio was also not happy with how filming was going. Finally, uh, the studio said we want him replaced. The rare decision of replacing the film's director after the start of production was made. Martin Brest was out and John Badham was brought in. The stars of the film, Matthew Broderick and Ali Sheedy, were concerned with the change. But eventually both were able to settle back into their characters with the new director at the helm. Parks and Lasker were also brought back to continue working on the script. The film was generally well received by audiences, but did receive some blowback from officials within the US military, seemingly annoyed with the depiction of a NORAD computer system being hacked into with a basic password. There were also complaints from Air Force officers about the film's presentation of an American military computer system being able to, on its own, execute retaliatory strikes against enemy targets. The officers stated no such computer exists, concerned that the film's story would worsen the image of the American military in the eyes of the public. But this seems to miss the point, as the scenario in the film is better viewed not as an example of how things were at the time, but viewed as a warning of where things might go, to be cautious of an over-reliance on computer systems making decisions, in addition to presenting the message that mutually assured destruction is not in the interest of humanity. When coming up with the film's story, the writers were initially unsure if people would believe the military could think the US was under attack because of a malfunctioning computer, but such mistakes did actually occur at the time. For six minutes this morning, the signals from the North American Air Defense Command headquarters indicated a nuclear attack against the United States. It was a false alarm. The cause reported this evening a computer error. Somebody's playing a game with us. While some were concerned the film might create a panic over the threat of nuclear war, the film was also putting a spotlight on another phenomenon, the rapidly evolving world of computer hacking. You're really into computers, huh? Yeah. The term hacker dates back to the mid-1950s, where it was used at a meeting of the Tech Model Railroad Club at MIT. The word then appeared in a 1963 article published in the MIT student newspaper, The Tech. The 1963 article was about students figuring out how to get around phone charges when making long-distance calls, a concept that's used in war games. You calling every number in Sunnyvale? Isn't that expensive? There's ways around that. Hackers finding ways of making free long-distance phone calls became a sensation in the 1970s, known as phone freaking. The technique involved emitting a specific tone over the phone line, allowing the caller to make free long-distance calls around the world. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, the founders of Apple Computer, they were also phone freaks. They were building these boxes called blue boxes, and you could actually make free phone calls with these boxes and they were selling them on Berkeley's campus back in 1975. And with that money, they were able to buy the components to build the first Apple One board. So phone freaking actually started Apple Computer. What's it doing? Oh, it's dialing numbers. The film also presents the technique of war dialing, which is accurately depicted as the auto dialing of many phone numbers for the purpose of finding a computer modem to communicate with on the other end. This technique actually became known as war dialing because of its use in war games. You can go to jail for that. Only if you're over 18. When trying to find a real world version of David from war games, the story of Kevin Mitnick is one that stands out. As a teenager, Mitnick was into phone freaking and other hacks like taking over speaker systems in McDonald's drive throughs and pranking the customers. As an adult, his hacking grew in scale with some serious consequences. And then in my hacking, my goal was to become the best hacker. It wasn't to get any particular type of information. It was essentially to see you know, how, how good I can get at circumventing security. And then I ended up getting into a lot of trouble. I hacked into a lot of companies. Eventually, when I got caught in 1995, they came down on me pretty, you know, pretty hard. 
and uh, they made me the example. After his release from prison, Kevin took on the moniker of the world's most famous hacker. He died of pancreatic cancer in 2023, but he spent over 20 years after his release from prison working as a cybersecurity expert. You sit at the top of what's become an entire industry of cybersecurity. I go around the world educating audiences and businesses on how to protect themselves against the threats out there. And I really enjoy doing that because it's kind of showing how the threats actually work and then educating the people inside how to, what to do to make sure it doesn't happen to them. When looking at today's world of hacking, there's much concern that individual actors are spying on you and your activities. But there is also an ease when looking at governments doing the same thing. When Edward Snowden came out in 2013 and revealed that the government was like monitoring everything we do, I was kind of, I suspected it, but then he kind of confirmed it. I go, oh my God, all my phone calls, all this, all that. Not that I had anything to particularly hide, but I want to protect my privacy. I don't think I should say anything else until I talk to a lawyer.